This, our Bibles, is a book about covenants, promises, oaths, vows. But unless we get too legalistic, it's also about love. We are committed, no matter what, to love and obey. This is what God wants for the bride of Christ. We know that Christ has said, the Father has said, the day and the hour no man knows. We are to be making ourselves ready because he is preparing a place for us. Well, what I wanted to speak about today, brethren, as was mentioned, we're coming into the Passover season. Uh, it's coming upon us very, very quickly. Now, those of us who keep it, there are aspects of it that we do every year. I, I know uh, uh, Mr. McMaster was over here uh, this last month and talked about the foot washing. You know, we, we do a foot washing service. And then we take of, of the bread, and then we take of the wine. And oftentimes we, t we speak of what these sacraments mean, but there's actually a far larger picture that God has planned for all of us, those who follow him, who obey him, and seek to be made one in a covenant with him. That's what I want to speak about today. Those covenants. Partially what we will be um, commemorating or recommitting ourselves to coming up on the Passover. Covenants are intended to be lifelong, binding, legal. It's a contract that you're not allowed to get out of unless somebody dies, somebody breaks it. It is for life, and it is bound by blood. This, our Bibles, is a book about covenants, promises, oaths, vows. But unless we get too legalistic, it's also about love. God is building a family. It's interesting that he started the creation, you know, with man and woman, and he made a covenant between them, that which we call holy matrimony. And that theme runs throughout the Word of God, throughout God's plan of salvation for all of us, for you and I. What began with a covenant between Adam and Eve ends with a wedding, a wedding supper. That God has planned for his son, for his kingdom being established on this earth. So I want to begin simply by looking at um, Genesis 15. Because we have the Abrahamic covenant. This is something that is done that today, we don't really understand. This isn't how we make contracts or agreements. However, there are places in the Middle East, amongst Bedouin tribes, where they still do this. This is something which was understood and acknowledged. Genesis 15, we'll look at verse 5. Because God had promised Abraham that he would be a father of nations. Genesis 15 and verse 5. And he brought him outside and said, Look now towards heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to them, So shall your descendants be. It's interesting that he's saying this to an old man who has no descendants. Not even one at this time who has longed to be a father. And he believed in the Lord, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And then he said to him, I am the Lord. And God's, 
God's placing his name upon it, who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land and to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. So it's not just one animal that's going to be sacrificed. This is every clean animal, actually, that's recognized as able to be sacrificed. And then he brought all these to him and cut them in two, down the middle, and placed each piece opposite the other. And he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. It's interesting because they're obviously unclean animals. They're scavengers. They're carrion eaters. And I think in some ways this is symbolic. God left this little description in here for a reason. Because in this world, there are so many things that are unclean, people, who seek to break the covenants. Continue in verse 12. And when the sun was going, uh, was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. In verse 13, And he said to Abram, this is God, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation that shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven. This is a flame. A burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. And most of us have read that. We understand that God is making a covenant with Abram, uh, who would become Abraham that he would be the father of many descendants, multitudes, nations. This is something which, again, those who lived during that time would understand. You know, when we get married, how how many of you are married? Yeah. How many of you had your father go to the father of the one that you wanted to marry and have them make a deal? You see, we don't don't do that. That's not something which we do. But that is something which Eastern cultures, many of them still do to this day. But this is the way that it was done. This is the way that the disciples would have grown up hearing about it. See, when you had children, when you had descendants, you wanted more. You wanted your family to be established and for it to grow, to be blessed. And so families, particularly the fathers, would look at other families that they would be united with, that it would be truly a blessing, not just for their children, but for their descendants. Again, that's not something which in our society most people think of. In our, our, our world doesn't plan for our children's children's children. We're all about just us today. But this is what they did. And so fathers would come together and they would say, I have a son or I have a daughter. And we know that you are a good family. And we want there to be a union. We see this as something which will be good and a blessing. And it will establish and grow both sides. And so the fathers would make a covenant. What they would do is they would take an animal and they would split it, kill it, sacrifice it, and pour its blood out on the sand. And then each father would step between the halves, step into the blood, and then step out. Their foot, or their sandal, would literally make their mark upon the ground. This is their impression and their promise. Because they're saying, if my child does not live up to this covenant, if they are not righteous, if they are not good, if they are not pure, if they do not uphold it, 
then it will be my death. Let this be my blood, and I'm signing it in blood. When we think of this covenant that the Father God is making with Abraham, who would be the father of the faithful, this is what they do. And it's not just one animal. It's all of them that can be sacrificed, that are clean, that are recognized by God. Now, why do you suppose that it is only God the Father who passed through, not once, but twice? Could the descendants of Abraham uphold the covenant? No. They couldn't. That was a covenant which they could not live up to. They were going to fail. They were not going to be pure and chaste and not follow after other gods and not not make all the same mistakes. And so God went through twice. Once for himself and his son, and then for Abraham's descendants. So that there could be this union. From this point on, I mean... We know that Christ's sacrifice, you know, that was established from the foundation of the world. But here, he's literally making the legal binding covenant that I will be the one to cover your children. These covenants were truly understood in ways that that we don't understand. There was to be a marriage. You know, Part of the the promise that God makes to Abram is that your children are going to be in a strange land. And they will multiply and become a nation. But they're going to be afflicted. But then, when their time is right, when it is right, I will bring them out. The first covenant, if we look at Exodus 24, and verse 3, When we take our vows in our, our own weddings, we make promises. Again, I, I got married when I was 23. Um, how many of us on that day when we stood before God and the minister and our friends and family and we said our vows, how many of us really understood how hard those were going to be? I mean, you mean like even on the bad days? I mean, even when, you know, they're not being very nice? See, the point of when we reach that point in our lives where we can make those promises, it's not that we're ready for them. We're going to grow into them. But we have enough understanding to make the commitment and to say, I do, until death do us part. I will give my life to this person, forsaking all others. No matter what happens in sickness and in death or in in poor health, Uh, in poverty, that we are committed, no matter what, to love and obey. This is what God wants for the bride of Christ. This is after he's given them the Ten Commandments. Exodus 24 and verse 3. And so Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said, we will do. They're literally saying, I do. We do. This is a marriage covenant. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, and he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain, and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins. Again, this is bound by blood. And half the blood and sprinkled it on the altar. And then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people. Again, they're making this promise, this covenant, not just once, but twice. And they all said, all that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. Now as we prepare for the time of the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, um, how long were they able to keep that covenant? Not, Not very long. They 
had God in their midst. They had his, you know, ordained leader. They couldn't follow him. But Christ was, or excuse me, God was their husband. Some examples of that. Isaiah 54 and verse 5. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth. For the Lord has called you like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, like a youthful wife when you have refused, says your God. He's saying, this is the covenant that we made. You are the bride and I am the husband. But again, they weren't able to stay faithful. They did go after foreign gods. They did commit abominations, sins before the Lord. But that's where the promise of covenant comes to you and I. Those who are of the spiritual household of Israel, who have entered into a bond uh, that began with baptism and that we're going to uh, commemorate and recommit ourselves to with the Passover. Jeremiah 31 and verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Again, this is a marriage covenant. Not according to the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, even though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I remember becoming a married man, still young. As I look back on myself, I was just a baby. But my wife and I looking at each other and saying, we're married. I'm, I'm your husband. And just the feeling of it, wow. I, it was a change. And, I, and I, I was growing into it, but it had been established. It was funny, we'd... You know, get up in the morning, she's like, hello, husband, you know, hello, wife, Mrs. Jones, Mr. Jones. It was new, and it was like, like the rings that we exchanged. It, it, it was there, and I could see it, and I would look at it, but it was so new. It took a little while to grow into it. But this is what we do when we make that covenant with God at baptism. We're making the vows, we're making the promises We've received God's Holy Spirit, but we're, we're really just starting out on the journey. Two weeks ago, my, my wife and I celebrated our 27th wedding anniversary. And we're thinking about it, we're talking about, do you remember this and do you remember that? And Can you believe we survived this? You know, that we've made it to this point. And we're not all the way done yet. But, you know, it's like, well, what would, what would you tell your young self back then? And I would say, it's going to be the hardest thing you've ever done. But it's going to be the best. The blessings that come from it. And, and you're going to grieve, you're going to cry, you're going to suffer through, you're going to put up with me. But it's, it's so good. And we look at the blessings that come from it. You know, when God expands our family and, and there are children... This is what God wants for us. Again, going back to Adam and Eve, there's a reason why they made Adam man in their image, and Eve, a family. Now, again, something that's very different uh, in our uh, society uh, with marriage. See, just because 
a man and a, a woman, a boy and a girl, were betrothed by their parents, it didn't mean that they didn't have a choice. It wasn't something that they just had to do. Because, honestly, who wants to marry someone who doesn't want to marry you? You know, if, if my bride had to be drugged to the altar, I'd be like, you know what, on second thought, it's, <laughs> I, I'm foreseeing this being a problem. You know, if I haven't won her over to where she wants to marry me, then, you know, it, who, who wants that? We want the love story. We want the romance. And we want them to enter into that covenant for life willingly. You know, as Christ is described returning as, as the bridegroom, leaping for joy. Even in this time, and even in that day and age, they were given a choice. When a man was to be married, and again his father had already made covenant, he would go to her family. And more often than not, she would make a meal, which would include bread. And they would eat, and break bread together. And part of the ceremony was he would show if he was pleased. He would say, you know, wow, he would compliment. And, and then he would place a wine cup before her. He'd already eaten her food and said how good it was and how much he accepted it. And now he would place the cup before her. And if she took and drank of the cup, it signified that she was willing to honor the covenant of her fathers, that she was willing to marry this man. Now at this point, they were legally married. Some of you remember the story of Joseph and Mary. They had not come together. They had not, there had not been the wedding supper, the feast. They had not had that yet. But they had had this, the exchanging of the food and the, and the wine. And they were bound. Because remember, when she was found to be pregnant by the Spirit, in order for them not to consummate the wedding, in order for them not to have the marriage supper, he would have to legally divorce her. They were bound. Now, he would go away. As Christ told his disciples, I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many mansions. Let's, let's look at that. Mark 14 and verse 22. Christ was with his disciples. He had already done the, the foot washing. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, eat. This is my body. Now, I dare say that at this moment, they knew there was something being done. Because there was bread on the table. They, they, they'd been having their meal. He'd already washed their feet. And, he's, and he stands up and declares this. They're going to recognize this ceremony. And then he took the cup, which he had given, or, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. They already knew what the, the first covenant was. They understood that that was a marriage covenant. But this is new for them. And he says, this is the, my blood of the new covenant. They recognized the symbols. They recognized what he was doing. And he says, assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. This is a marriage betrothal. After sharing the cup and having it accepted, he would go to prepare a place for her. Again, this is usually attached to his father's household. The bride would now know that there was a period of time to make herself ready just as the groom was making a home for her. We look at the Gospel of John. John 14. 
and verse 1. Again, these are passages which we often read on the Passover. But do we really understand what we're committing to? What we are doing every year? John 14 and verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And where I go, you know. And the way you know. Again, that's another aspect of the betrothal and the, the wedding. I'm assuming that all of you are familiar with the parable of the, the wise and the foolish virgins. They were waiting for the return of the groom. There was a time period in which they knew it would take for him to prepare a place for them to live. And he could not come and claim his bride until his father said, It is complete. It is finished. It is worthy of where you can bring your bride. She has made herself ready. And then he would come. And the hour, the the virgins didn't know. The bride and all the bridesmaids. Now more often in in, uh, in villages that that they would have all been familiar with, they didn't live all that far apart. Maybe he was in the next town or, or whatever, but people would come by and they're like, I saw the, uh, the work going on at uh, Joseph's place. It's getting close. There'd be excitement. And her family would be putting together things, just like we do today. You know, when we're looking forward to a wedding, you know, something borrowed, something blue. You know, they're, they're gathering all these things for this wedding. She's, she's getting her friends together. But I can't begin to tell you how much stress it would have put on my wife if we hadn't set an actual date. We know that Christ has said, the Father has said, the day and the hour no man knows. We are to be making ourselves ready because he is preparing a place for us. When he comes, it will be a surprise, just as it was for the wise and foolish virgins. We are waiting for the return of the king, of the bridegroom, of Christ. We will be rededicating ourselves on the Passover. We are rededicating our lives just as we did with our baptism. And that's one of the things which we do typically in the church of God. Before we baptize someone, before we lay them back into the water, we ask them, have you repented of your sins? And they say, I have. And we say, do you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And they say, I do. It's the same thing that we do in the marriage ceremony. These are the covenants. These are the promises. Do you take this this person to be your lawfully wedded wife, to be your lawfully wedded husband? And what do we say? I do. That covenant which we made at baptism and which we will uh, recommemorate which we will do again on the Passover, is the accepting of the bread. It is the accepting of the wine. Because we are waiting for the wedding supper to come. Revelations 19 and verse 6. And over the last, I don't know, maybe 50 years or so, Weddings have become a much bigger thing in our, our nation. Um, it used to be that the family would gather together, there'd be a minister, there'd be a cake, and he'd wear a suit, and she'd have a nice dress on, and they'd get married. Nowadays, it has to cost thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. You know, and it's got to be a dress that is you know, designed by someone else, and no one has ever seen it or worn it, anything like that. Those are vanity. But brethren, this, the wedding of the Lord, of Jesus Christ, 
everything else will pale into insignificance. And it won't be about vanity, it'll be about righteousness and pure agape love. Revelations 19 and verse 6, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous act of the saints. That dress that every bride looks forward to, it's always been important. You know, there were hope chests. That's something that girls used to keep. That they were waiting for that day when they would get married. And they would, they would put that away. The dress has always been important. It will be again. But it will be the righteous acts of the saints. In verse 9, And then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. Brethren, you have been called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. It is by our willingness to enter into covenant with God, with Christ. Those, those words which we speak saying, I do. When we are washed, have our feet washed at the at the Passover service. That's what God had the children of Israel do before accepting the covenant with, with Him at Mount Sinai. They had to bathe. They had to wash all their clothes and come clean to enter into covenant. When we take that bread and the wine, we are again making covenant with God. Giving ourselves to Him. Brethren, as I said earlier, this is, this is a romance. It is the greatest romance ever written. And it's true. It's, it's not something made up. It's not Hollywood. It is desire for God to have a family. To have a bride. To join Him in a perfect kingdom. It began with a man and one woman. And it will end with a marriage of Christ and His bride. The ecclesia, the church that have been called to this wedding, to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Brethren, when we are washed in just a few days, and we take the bread and the wine, it is a solemn occasion. Because... We are recognizing that it is His body broken for us. It is His blood which is shed for us. But it also shows us just how much He loves us. And how much He wants us to be His bride. Because He was willing to give His life. In a, a silly romantic movie that I watched decades ago, a young man asked an older man and he said, how do I know if she's the one? How do I know if she's the one that I should marry? And the older man looked at her and or looked at him and he said, Would you die for her? The young man said, I would. And he said, Then that's what you do. And she is the one. That's Hollywood. This is real, brethren. That which you have been called into. And, and when we take of the bread and the wine and we think of the sacrifice, it is solemn. But it is the most beautiful gift that we can be given. And in this, brethren, on the Passover, we rejoice. You have received this information based upon the Word of God. Every additional topic concerning the truth which originates in Scripture, 
builds understanding leading to salvation. We hope you will personally review the scriptures cited in this presentation. God will teach you if you ask him. Until next time, good day. Thank you.